But again. So do you believe the senior State Department official who sent this email was lying? Senator, I, I can't comment on not, I don't know who that's from. I don't know if it's, I've never seen it before. So, so you're the chief diversity officer and you're arguing you are certain discrimination is not happening at the State Department. Is that right? Is that, is that what you're testifying? That's what you I, just said. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Abercrombie, Wynn Stanley. The Biden administration, I believe, is staffed by radicals. The State Department has consistently alienated our friends and appeased our enemies. You're empowered as the State Department's first standalone chief diversity and inclusion officer. Your mandate is to promote a concept on the left called equity, which I think is nothing more than brazen discrimination. You were appointed in April 2021, and as you extensively testified this morning, you introduced fundamental changes to the State Department hiring practices in line with the mandate of equity to affirmatively and aggressively discriminate. A year after your appointment, in April 2022, the State Department released its, quote, equity action plan to integrate <coughs> these so-called equity principles into, quote, all aspects of State Department foreign affairs. That very week, just days after you published the equity action plan, and one year after you began your tenure, a senior State Department official broadly distributed what I consider to be a very troubling email. I have a copy of that email next to me. Let me read from a part of the email. The email says that hiring practices have developed inside the State Department so that, and I'll quote, that certain candidates could not be hired because they have a disability. They are white men. They are straight white men. They are not of the, quote, right religion. All of these are verbatim quotes from the email of a senior State Department official. My first question to you is, did you clear this guidance? Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I've never seen that before. You've, ne you've never seen the email before? I've never seen it. So you didn't know it had been sent? This is the first time I'm seeing it, sir. Well, do you, do you know that it is happening? That the State Department perceives, and this is, I believe, as a result of your work, that they have a mandate to discriminate against, as the email says, to discriminate against people with disabilities, to discriminate against white men, to discriminate against straight white men, and to discriminate against people that are not of the, quote, what, right religion. I'm not sure what that meant, but I suspect it meant that if someone is a Christian. I don't know that because that's not what the email says. Are you aware these practices are happening at the State Department? Again, thank you for the question. Uh, I am definite and certain that they are not happening at the State Department. But again... So do you believe the senior State Department official who sent this email was lying? Senator, I, I can't comment on not... I don't know who that's from. I don't know if it's, I've never seen it before. So. so you're the chief diversity officer and you're arguing you are certain discrimination is not happening at the State Department. Is that right? Is that, is that what you're testifying? That's what you I, just said. I am saying that it is against the law and we certainly are not overtly or on purpose breaking the law in the Department of State. Certainly there are uh, members of our organization who do discriminate, who do harass, who do bully, which is why we are trying to put in place programs to address it and to strengthen accountability for those who do so, indeed break the law. So you didn't clear this guidance, and after it was sent, you're testifying now that you remained unaware of it, so no one, no one showed it to you. You were in the State Department for a year. You were empowered in your position in an unprecedented way. In your testimony, 
You talked about creating a DEIA data working group about hiring practices and a dedicated DEIA core precept. And your testimony is you didn't know that this discrimination was happening. My, my staff can transmit to you the exact header and the details of this email. Okay. But I have to say, Ambassador, I find it a little bit amazing that this discrimination is being reported to be ongoing in the administration and you are professing to be unaware of it you know, I'm reminded from a line from the movie Office Space. What would you say you do around here? What is your job if not to stop discrimination? And unfortunately, I believe what your job in practice is, is encouraging this discrimination. This is a manifestation. You just said a minute ago in testimony, your hiring and promotion in the State Department will depend on complying with the edicts from your office. Is it good for the State Department and good for the United States government to be actively discriminating based on disability, based on race, based on being straight white men, or based on not being the right religion? Is that good or bad? Uh, Senator, as I'm looking at the email, it does appear to me, and my eyesight is not great, that people have reported it comments. That's certain candidates. So what it says Just, is, sorry. unfortunately, over the past several months, a number of people have reported comments that certain candidates could not be hired right. because. So these right. are employees at the State Department saying, we can't hire someone because, and here's what the email lists, they have a disability, they're white men, they're straight white uh, men, or they're not of the right religion. Indeed. And so I would say comments does not at all say it is indeed happening comments from hiring people saying we can't hire them because of it. Time of the senator has well expired. Senator Rubio. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ambassador Abercrombie Wentz Stanley. Um, the president's executive order, I think it's 13985, it provides a, a list of underserved communities and it mandates that executive agencies seek to promote equitable, fair and impartial outcomes for those communities. And, and I, I too believe not only is diversity our strength as a country, um, but um, if in fact our workforce does not reflect our population, then it merits a inquiry into what are the impediments? Are there any artificial impediments that are leading to that outcome? And in, in the list of, um, of the underserved communities are, are groups that have historically faced discrimination in this country on the basis of their race, their religion, their gender, but it also includes a list of other groups. First generation college students, which, which I happen to be, people with limited English speaking ability, immigrants, the elderly, former convicts, people from rural areas, military spouses, single parents, all good groups. I'm just curious if we include all the people that have been discriminated against historically, plus all of these other groups, who is not an underserved community? Thank you for your question, Senator. Um, I can tell you that my office looks at this two ways. A, that our responsibility uh, is focused on those groups who have been historically underrepresented in the Department of State who are protected classes. And so that is a more narrow list of people, the first group that you mentioned. The reality is, as we work to remove barriers to those groups, we are in fact leveling the playing field for every group. We're focused on making merit-based decisions, so removing those artificial barriers. So when we do things like ensure that people can interview for the Department of State via a virtual uh, technique, while it might indeed help uh, groups that are in the center of the country or from families that can't afford a $1,000 plane ticket to fly to San Francisco or Washington, D.C., it's also going to touch on other groups of people who also have that problem. So in that way, we are able to hit that wide variety of no, I, I, and I, I understand, but I mean, when, when, when you add to the, when the, and I know you didn't write the executive order, but what I'm saying is that when underserved communities expands to includes, yeah. 
you know, all these other groups, which are all, I mean, there's nothing, I understand the struggles or the challenges of each of these groups individually. It just seems like we've really narrowed the pool of people who we don't, do not consider underserved to a very narrow category of people, which, which obviously begs the question, um, you know, what in, information, do we keep a list of, for example, the religious affiliations of all the employees? Um, do we keep we do. a list of everybody's ethnicity? Yeah. Uh, we collect limited information on uh, demographic information, and we have a number of employee organizations that group around many of these other characteristics that you've mentioned, uh, whether it be um, singles at state, working parents at state, uh, veterans. None of those are protected classes per se, but they do have issues that employees talk about, work with our HR, our global talent management, to ensure that they have a, a level playing field and the ability to serve to the best of their ability when they're in the department. I, I guess my point is I don't know how we can possibly make these efforts to help these groups, broad array of, of individual groups that have been defined as underserved without collecting information about all of these topics. Are they the first to go to college in their family? What's their religion? What's their race? Mm -hmm. How, what do they speak English? Uh, yeah. Are they immigrants? I mean, that's the, 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 that's the point I'm trying to make. We're collecting a lot of information. My time is short. I did want to ask you, um, I'm curious how U.S. interests were advanced uh, by promoting a film festival in, in Portugal that, that highlighted uh, Min Ban, which uh, is a film about a 17-year-old boy who has sexual relations with an adult bartender, and Saint Narcisse, uh, which I think is how you pronounce it, which is a film about incestuous twins. Um, how would promoting, which was part of some sort of drag queen film festival in Portugal, how does that advance our national interest and how much taxpayer money was spent putting on this film festival? Thank you for the question, Senator. I will take it back to get an answer for you. I do not know. You're not familiar with this? Uh, I am not familiar. So you don't, we don't, you don't know how much we spend or how many State Department employees work? You're just not familiar with the topic? I'm not familiar with those films or that festival. So. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you handle festivals as part of your portfolio? I do not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Senator. Well, does she handle? No, no, Mr. Chairman. Did, yeah. That's not the point. The point is it's part of the diversity. The point is I just want to clarify for the record that well, she does not handle festivals. It's a legitimate question, and I look forward for her to get back. She handles di diversity and equity issues, which was but, part of a diversity but, and equity but, initiative.